Now this is going to sound uh, cheesy, but I was going to say the same thing about Bob. Because <laughs> they really are, here in Northville Township, they're very innovative. I mean, they're dealing with some complex issues right now, and they work like a team with his leadership on coming up with innovative solutions to some of those issues. So it's actually uh, really an honor to, to serve uh, the Northville community. So because they're in the same mindset. We can't just keep doing things the way we're doing and expecting different results. And that's what tonight's all about. Um, this, uh, this concept of these town halls kind of got born out of a little bit of frustration. Um, and uh, it's been frustration trying to put out their innovation in the government space. And uh, most recently, there's the direct farm repair Medicaid pilot that I was promoting that would have saved the taxpayers of Michigan about three and a half billion dollars. And the way that they save the money is actually by giving people better care on Medicaid. Um, what a concept. Better services, less money, but that's not something we can do in government. So I said, I know a group of people that actually does appreciate that, and that's the private sector. So 75% of the market here in Michigan is around private sector. So that's the target of tonight's discussion and why we're driving these town halls. The goal is to be able to expand um, these, uh, we're going to talk about some free market health care options uh, across the state so that Michigan can be ground zero of a free market health care revolution. And we're going to go over why that's really important in the end. Um, I think half the people here, I think, are doctors. And if, if you want to know what's really ailing our health care system, I mean, look at that diagram. By the way, that's not just some random fingerprinting up there or finger painting up there. That's, a, that's actually a, a functional diagram of the Affordable Care Act. Each one of those dots. If you look at it real closely, you can get it up here. It actually has a section reference. That reference corresponds to a section in this little baby, which is otherwise known as HR 3590, also known as the Affordable Care Act, also known as the Um Believe it or not, what we're going to focus in on today is a way to drive some Mack trucks through some free market loopholes in this little bit, a little lot uh, of here. And uh, we've got some innovators here that are going to help guide us through that. And uh, we're going to keep things off. But before we go too far, first of all, once again, I want to thank the people at Northville Township for inviting us and hosting this event. But I also want to introduce my team in uh, Lansing, because a lot of them are here with us today. Um, Penny Kreider, right here, uh, who also now uh, getting her film major as our, uh, so we'll have this recorded and posted online as soon as we can get a process. Um, so she's our new district manager, so out in the district you'll see her around a lot. We also have Nick Plesha over here in the corner. Nick. Nick is my legislative director, so he's the guy that helps move our bills to the system and corrects it and tells me all the things that I'm, I'm writing wrong when I put the legislation out there and says that clarifies the way it's supposed to look so other people can understand it that aren't engineers. So uh, <laughs> he's been a big help and he does a lot of research around things like healthcare that's really helped us out. Also, Joanne De Hayer, she's our office manager. She helps out, so when you're uh, back up in Lansing, she's the one that keeps everything running smoothly for everybody and works with a lot of our interns. And uh, last but not least, because she's now officially a short timer, and she was heading up and kicking off these town halls for us, it's Matea Brandenburg. And uh, so Matea is actually going to Germany to start a master's degree in economic development. So I'm um, sure she's going to be talking a lot about healthcare if she goes forward and studies that. And I also want to introduce my panel members that are going to be with me here today. And, uh, they're going to be handing off the baton to you after a brief uh, kind of an umbrella presentation on healthcare. And uh, on the left here, we've got Dr. Chad Savage, and he's going to talk about our primary care service. And you do have your choice for right here. You probably saw that out there. He's actually a practicing direct primary care doc. Next to him, we have Teresa McIntosh with, uh, she's got a couple different badges here, uh, Complete Care Center and Health Sharing Plans. Um, And she's a business manager for them, so she's going to talk about the X's and O's that's really going to make uh, the accountants in the room very excited. <laughs> and then Dr. Roland Tindall, who works with uh, Teresa and uh, one of the early adopters in direct farm repair space and, and actually showing free market solutions for a long time and uh, 
Uh, it's a blessing to have him here to lend his experience into this discussion as well. <laughs> he just got off a very long motorcycle ride here. So the fact that he's sitting down right now at all is an amazing achievement. So uh, anyway, so thank you very much for coming out here tonight. And I, I'm going to drill down into this a little bit here. And uh, you know why we're trying to do this? Um, it went dead. Uh, uh, Alright, so remember, the goal is to have instances of this all around the state because I am in full free market healthcare evangelism mode and everybody in this room, if you like the stuff that you're hearing today, I need y'all to help me out on that evangelism part because a lot of people are intimidated by this little polka dot diagram here and a lot of people want people to be intimidated by that and uh, we're going to kind of talk about ways to, to uh, not be intimidated and some very practical ways that I think so. Alright, so the objectives of tonight. And I you know, can I you hear me if I come away from this microphone? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Walk and talk. Alright, good stuff. Alright. So the town hall objectives. We've got folks here that are doctors. If you're a doctor in the audience, please raise your hand. Alright, so everybody's gonna have very good health care tonight. <laughs> So, if you're an employer in, the, in this room, which could still be a doctor, please raise your hand. All right, got a few. Okay, good. All right, and if you're an uh, insurance expert, somebody that's looking at underwriting, please raise your hand. All right, so we got a few there. How about people that are just um, enrollees in health plans that want to know more about what we can do to fight back on, on health care? All right, good. All right. Well, that wasn't exactly the target demographic we were heading for, but gosh darn it, I love it. So, because uh, ultimately that's who gets impacted by this. Um, but what I'm really trying to do is start playing matchmaker with employers, because if you're going to, you know, we're trying to promote a free market healthcare option. Well, you don't promote free market healthcare options by putting forward a government mandate saying thou shalt adopt us. I mean, that's the Obamacare approach, right? Um, so what you got to do is start playing matchmaker. So, employers to service providers. That's what we're trying to do. Um, so, as you come away from tonight, please start thinking of ways that you can do your own eHarmony magic uh, as you lead here, okay? All right, but the goal is to talk about all this in context of some free market health plan. In other words, no more polka dots. So, key folks are talking about it. We just had a lot of folks raising their hands on it. We got patients, and you're probably concerned about, hey, how do I avoid a fine with all this from the, uh, from the uh, IRS agents that want to knock on my door and, and find out how much health care I'm getting and how much I'm paying for it? Um, I want to know what's covered, what's the total cost, and can I see my doctor? So on the business side, well, hey, i got to pay for this. How much is it going to cost? Um, what are the risks of increased costs? I mean, am I susceptible to something on the, on the uh, higher end on this? Or if, uh, what happens if I actually save money and I have lower claims rate? What happens? Is it easy to manage? Um, I, I don't need another hassle, another set of uh, hassles for me to manage. I want this to be turnkey so that I don't have to worry about it all. And then for a physician, I mean, there's some basic business practice questions like how much does it cost to run? Um, uh, can I make enough money to keep the lights on? Um, we know, we have friends, my wife Angie here in the front row is a, is a pediatrician. We have friends that have literally, doctors that have literally worked themselves to death handling all this stuff that happens behind the scenes for a doctor's practice. They got into medicine just so they could go off and practice medicine and make people well. But the realities of what's happening in the medical community right now, which is why you see half the people here raising their hands when you ask for a doctor, is that they're looking for help and they're looking for a way out of this garbage right here. All right, so those, that's basic on I don't know if you guys remember this back when the Affordable Care Act was pitched. The whole pitch was to lower costs, improve quality, coverage, and protect consumer choice. Um, did that happen? No, that's not what we got. We got this. And uh, can anybody identify where the doctors and the patients are in this diagram? I'll give you a little clue. Here's physicians. Here's patients. In between the two of them, there are 159 new organizations. 
Do you think that 159 new organizations is going to lower costs? Somebody's got to pay their bills. By the way, most of these guys are on DC. Cost of living there ain't cheap. And do you think that they're going to improve care? Because you, you all hear about how MBAs know everything you need to know about you know, taking good care of somebody, right? So they're not going to do either one of them. So my contention is um, the Affordable Care Act is not affordable. It's not caring. It is an act. It is always about control. It's not about care. And it's, uh, that's why the focus on free market solutions, because there are ways for us to go off and ignore those organizations between a doctor and a patient. That's what we're going to talk about tonight. All right, so this whole spaghetti diagram, when you actually try to distill it into what kind of health plans can I get now, it kind of breaks into this basic set of categories, all right? You've got a concept of a qualified health plan. A qualified health plan per Obamacare is essentially, think of that as um, the type of health plan that will keep the IRS from knocking on my door at midnight saying that I'm not paying enough in taxes. All right, you all know about the penalties. If you don't have the proper coverage, uh, they'll say your papers are not in order, knock on your door and give you a fine when you file your tax returns, right? So if you have a qualified health plan, you're not supposed to get a visit from the IRS. Um, there's also Medicaid, right? In Michigan, they did Medicaid expansion because it's not good enough just to have Medicaid, you got to expand it. Um, and uh, the focus of that is on managed care plans. And I don't know how many of you guys know this, but it built into all the Medicaid contracts here in the state of Michigan, they are actually promoting the conversion of uh, primary care uh, practices into what are called patient-centered medical homes. And essentially these patient-centered medical homes are justification for all the spaghetti diagram that you see here. Um, so think of it as an overhead justification act <laughs> or a promotion. So it's all pushing the managed care approach to it. And I, you know, I, uh, I've looked at different ways of going off and providing quality health care for quite a while. And the key thing to keep in mind is that managed care, whether it's managed by the government or managed by a private insurance company, the way that they make money and the way that they cut costs is by rationing care. And uh, it's, that's the dirty nose truth of it. And when you think about that in context of Medicaid, okay, now all the doctors are looking at their pagers. <laughs> but if you turn, if you turn in context of Medicaid, we have 2.4 million citizens in Michigan that are on Medicaid now, thanks to Medicaid expansion. That is about 25% of our population. So one in four of our citizens is on Medicaid. And, uh, you know, I'm not a big fan of government assistance, but if you're going to provide government assistance, make sure it's quality care and make sure that it's uh, best value for the taxpayer. That's not what's being done right now, but it's mostly because they're incentivizing managed care plans. Um, and there's also CHIP associated with that. On the other half of the CMS branch here, we have Medicare. And we all know about Parts A, Parts through, through D on it. We're not gonna go into Medicaid or Medicare in any detail at all today, um, but I do wanna highlight one other opportunity for a health plan, and it's something that you can specifically get an exemption um, with the IRS until I think it's a form 804 or something like that, that with the IRS and it says that if I'm in a healthcare um, ministry um, like uh, Christian MediShare or something like that then I essentially get a get out of jail free card with the IRS. It doesn't meet all the minimum requirements of a qualified health plan but because it has a special exemption written into this bad boy um, they get a get out of jail free card. And then of course <laughs> There's always the option where you sit there and say, talk to the hand government, I'm going to go off and get my own health care. A lot of people do this in the context of uh, concierge care. Whenever you look at socialized medicine across anywhere in the world, you're seeing it's a two-tier system you know, for the has and the have-nots. And uh, if you can afford it, especially in the days of a health plan, a high deductible health plan where the deductibles are $5,000, $10,000, so it's pretty much in this open market for a lot of your health care services as it is. But um, bottom line, this is your basic options. We're going to drill down a little bit more on the qualified health plan. But one thing I want to highlight is that it's taken me a while to kind of rationalize this because there's a lot of new acronyms, a lot of new terms thrown into this that uh, are, they seem like they're deliberately put in there to try to confuse people who are stupid enough like myself to actually go try to read this. Um, the way I broke it out is they've got essentially exchange-based plans that are qualified health plans. 
that's for the for-profit insurers. So you hear about all these insurance companies that are saying, I'm out of here in regards to the exchanges. Aetna is the latest one that came out of it. Um, United Health, I think, was one of the first ones that actually got out of it. There's others that are essentially dropping off because they deliberately try to make it very difficult for private insurers to operate in this, in this market. So that was kind of designed to fail, if you ask me. And these exchange-based plans are essentially for the for-profit insurer. The next group is for the non-profit insurer. Um, and uh, one of these days we'll talk about the difference between a for-profit and a non-profit company. Um, for the time being, this suffice to say, one pays taxes, the other one doesn't. Otherwise, it's not a heck of a lot of difference. Um, but the, uh, they call them consumer or operator-oriented plans, and that's for the nonprofit insurance company. It gives you an opportunity to set up a quote-unquote nonprofit insurance. That's their, their segue into, um, uh, you know, that, anyway, we'll get into the details on that. The next one is essentially the so-called single-payer option that they're moving toward, and that is the government-based insurance, which is definitely nonprofit. <laughs> um, but, uh, um, and that's the other three breakouts. So all these fancy terms, exchange-based, consumer-operated-oriented, community health insurance, I tried to simplify into for-profit, non-profit, and government-based, and uh, I've been testing that for a while, it seems to hold some water. The other class of plans that's going to play into what we're talking about tonight is so-called ERISA-based plans. Now, ERISA is around retirement income, but it deals with OPEB or other post-employment benefits, and it deals with the guidelines around actu actuarial rules around um, how insurance is regulated. And the, the interesting thing about that is that any of the plans that are specifically called out in context of the Affordable Care Act on that are actually exempt from state-based regulations. So this is a, a get-out-of-state get regulation free card, essentially, if you have an ERISA-based plan. And so some of the plans we're going to talk about tonight are in the self-funded insurance model area. They are subject to federal regulations. They are not subject to state regulations. And that's um, something we'll get into in a little bit. And there's some advantages, disadvantages, all that stuff. Like that. So I'm going to try to simplify a discussion of a qualified health plan because in order, we have to kind of break this concept of a health plan down into some two basic parts for the purpose of today's discussion or tonight's discussion. So a health plan has got two major components. Primary care, that's your repeatable, turn your head and cough, go in every once in a while, get, get weighed, and um, uh, type of exam. So that's your primary care. Um, and then you've got your, and, and I'm sure Chad can go into much more detail on what happens in that. Um, <laughs> and then catastrophic care. So that's the stuff that uh, when things go bump in the night, so you get hit by a bus, so you have to go to a hospital, the stuff that traditionally is what you needed insurance for. It was the stuff that you couldn't afford. In today's day and age, they're trying to make health plans equal to um, health management. And it used to be these insurance plans are more about health management. Um, and, to, uh, and they used to be just about risk management. And uh, what you're going to hear tonight is a different way of going off and approaching that risk management. But you need those two ingredients, primary care plus catastrophic care, and equals a health plan. Now, if it's, if in order to be a qualified health plan, you have to meet the benefits, the essential benefits of uh, section 1302 of this bad boy. And that lists all those different minimum health care requirements. So, Guys, make sure you have your maternity care and newborn care because, you know, you never know when you're going to need that, especially in today's day and age. Um, so, focus first on primary care. This is going to be a segue. This is the part that Dr. Savage is going to be talking about. Um, and uh, essentially what we're trying to do with this direct primary care is set it up so that all these little ink blots that are up here, we simplify and just focus in on physicians and the patients. All the rest of those guys go bye-bye. So 80% of the transactions you have for healthcare, we say, talk to the hand, federal government. We're not talking to you at all. Um, and we're gonna focus back on the basics. And if you get it focused back on the doctor and the patient, you get some improvements in preventive care. That's the stuff that everybody talks about. If you are taking better care of yourself with prevention, you decrease the overall catastrophic incidence and you lower the overall cost. So that's what Chad's gonna be talking about tonight. Now, in the state of Michigan, I was fortunate enough to pass a law back in 2014 that made sure that we didn't allow them to play any games with the direct primary care market 
in Michigan. In other words, we've set it up so that you cannot treat it as an insurance product in the state of Michigan. And, and we put in stipulations around transparency and the requirements of a contract between a doctor and a patient, but that's it. Um, and it's probably one of the most transparent business models you'll see in medicine right now in Michigan. Um, the, uh, and by the way, Michigan's not alone. I'm working with other states that just most recently um, worked with the folks in Nebraska and gave them a care package to get them to pass it. We pa I helped pass it out in Tennessee recently. Um, we're working with the folks in West Virginia, folks in Florida. So the reason I'm working with these other states is that if we can get critical mass with the states, then maybe we can get the federal government woken up to the fact that, hey, maybe this isn't such a bad idea. All right? So we're working on that. Uh, the federal government, once we get them to wake up to the fact that there are some common sense solutions that don't involve bigger government and more dots on a diagram here, uh, if we, we, right now you can't pay for direct primary care directly from an HSA. That's something that should be corrected. Right now, um, we want to make sure that the way it's written in the Affordable Care Act, there isn't any explicit definition of direct primary care services, which means that any day now, we could have a uh, change in the, regu the regulatory body could go back and decide they want to change the definition of direct primary care services. We don't want to play that game. Right now, they're not doing it because it's got enough traction. they got some big influential donors that are keeping that from happening right now. But we want to make sure we protect that space and protect direct primary care, not just in statute, but also in regulation. But also, we want some basic things like allowing for these services to be paid for by Medicare and for Medicaid. So a couple reforms we're looking for at the federal level. I've actually got a resolution in the in, uh, House Health Policy, it's SCR 5, that's being held up by Representative Colton in the House right now that's calling for the federal government to do just this. So let's talk catastrophic here quickly. And um, that's where Teresa is going to chime in with Dr. Tinder. So we're going to talk about um, Qualified, essentially that wraparound coverage or that catastrophic care is what she's going to drill into. And the focus is going to be on self-funded insurance. And I think Chad might touch a little bit on Christian Medicare maybe, but uh, he might mention it. But if he goes into it in any detail, you guys are welcome to throw tomatoes at him. He loves this stuff. Uh, <laughs> all right, so primary care plus catastrophic care equals an overall health plan. Make sense? That's the framework for tonight. This is why this is so important to state legislators. By the way, there's no such language like this in the federal constitution. This is in our Michigan constitution, however. And here's the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. And this is why it's so important to me. Um, and is that when you look at what expanding access to lower cost and higher quality care means, for private employers, we've got about $31 billion a year that we spend on health care here in the state of Michigan. We've got 10 million citizens. If you can get a 20% savings off of that, that's $6 billion per year freed up to hire new employees, to give employees raises, to be more competitive in the marketplace. Big, big options, uh, opportunities for job growth here in the state of Michigan. Look at it from a public employee's perspective. All right, we've got 51,000 state employees. We spent about $664 million at the state level on health care. At the local level, in school districts, local municipalities, about $775 million. We could save another $280 million a year by deploying this across the board. And that's just the direct primary care element. We haven't even gotten into the self-funded stuff on this. So there's huge opportunities to save the taxpayers money. So if you want to know why I fight road tax increases, it's because we haven't looked at ways to go off and deliver our services more economically and more effectively in government yet. And, but the big enchilada that I alluded to below was Medicaid. Our single largest line item in the state budget is Medicaid. $17.5 billion out of a $54.9 billion budget. Um, I had a pilot that's a modest pilot for 2,400 out of our 2.4 million enrollees that went as far as the uh, leadership uh, conference committee and then got scrubbed out of the budget. And, um, and thus we have all the energy associated with me putting into this town hall now. <laughs> so, um, anyways, huge opportunity. So we're focused on the private sector, but ultimately we want to make sure that we get the best value to our taxpayers. Um, if you want more info, please go to morningmichigan.com. We've got actually some of my editorials that talk about what the value proposition is for government. I've actually one called Government Swiss Army Knife that walks through 
all, all the different uh, impacts of having a good quality health care option in the state. That's back there. Um, you go to morningmichigan.com, which is my Senate webpage. Tons of editorial. I think I've probably written a dozen editorials on the subject out there. Um, I'm now writing, I'm going to be writing for Forbes on this subject, so we're going to be getting some more information out on that. Um, and these videos that you're going to, uh, for tonight, you're going to see up on that website as well. And you can always follow on social.